think I think we'll we'll uh, we'll kick off um, mainly due to the fact that after this is lunch, so we don't want to you know keep you away from the from the buffet. It's it's always a bad idea to keep people away from the buffet. Um, welcome everybody, and welcome to this uh, this session on uh, putting integrity on the map. I think if anybody was uh, in doubt that this is an international conference, I think this panel actually is the is the really like a good image on how international this conference is. We will hear from Indonesia. We're going to hear from uh, from Brazil. We're going to hear from Colombia, and then we're going to hear about the, the like the FIFA uh, the World Cup um, from as I've been told, a Canadian living in. in in the Netherlands, so uh, so this is uh, this is an extremely international panel, uh, and and I actually think looking at it, I'm 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 very thrilled to actually get this going because I think we will we will hear some some really really good presentations. Um, so I don't think I'm going to take up much more time. I think I'm going to leave it over to the people who actually have something interesting to say rather than me just you know babbling on about a lot of different stuff. So I want to invite um, Amal Ganesh up here to talk about. Um, um, talk about a, a good governance and, and leadership in Indonesian football um, and some of the research he's been doing um, on, on this topic. So, uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for playing the for, for play the game for inviting uh, us. So I'm I'm going to talk about uh, about a qualitative study. Can we describe ideal leaders for football association? Do good leaders uh, matter or impactful for a sport organization? So. Okay, uh, so uh, this research or this study was led by uh, Aris Kaur but uh, he, he is not here. So I'm the researcher, I'm the Kamal Ganesa. Uh, so I, I will start with the background why we did this. So uh, there, 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 were, there have been a cycle of crises happening in Indonesian football. In the last ten years, uh, lots of uh, terrible lands, lot of lots of political uh, conflicts between the association and the governments. Just for example, in the, in late two thousand ish, uh, our our the, the Indonesian Football Federation chairman was a member of a political party, and then he was uh, involved in a graph case. And then the public started to push to kick him out. And then after that tragedy, maybe two years after, in 2011, there, there were another uh, conflicts. This time a dualism between uh, two parties or two sides in the, who, who, who wanted to take over the association, the Indonesian Football Federation. 
and then uh, actually uh, in in short the Indonesian FA has been struggling to stabilize powers uh, to uh, control its stakeholders such as the supporters and the government uh, in 2015 the Indonesian sports ministry shut down the, the Indonesian FA because of such a very domestic in my view domestic uh, conflict or domestic problem which which is not really uh, matter in, 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 in national perspective because of conflicts of interest of the sports minister with it, with, with, with his, his uh, position and then later on uh, more than 60 people died because of football violence since 1990s in Indonesia uh, most of which more than 50% uh, happened in last 10 years and then in September last year, a fan was brutally killed by uh, rival supporters. Probably the, the most brutal uh, supporter died in, in the history of the nation. Uh, and then the public and the media has since put a pressure toward the Indonesian FA. Uh, the then passage chairman at the time in January stepped down because because, oh, sorry, after, after, the, after the death of the Haringa case, uh, the media started to probe another legislation, this time a match, a match fixing cases. Uh, the match fixing cases uh, eventually really happened, and uh, named as of April uh, 15 suspects charged with criminal uh, law. And then in January, before, before, before April, the 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 person the, the Indonesian FA chairman stepped down. Uh, we then, as a, a sport NGO, initiated a study because we we've seen that this uh, leadership in past ten years uh, were proof you no know, cannot uh, solve the problems within the internal or external powers or the governance uh, matter in in at the association. So. Our research question is: What kind of leaders do a for, do, a for, do a football association need, and uh, what kind of leaders that can stabilize powers, that can stabilize turbulence, conflicts that happened in last ten years? A purpose of study: uh, We we wanted to help uh, football stakeholders to finally find the ideal leader. Um, and we, we, we wanted also to promote subject of sport governance and management in Indonesia, which is now very in the face of early developing. Uh, we wanted also to influence policymakers to make a decision based on uh, scientific measures and evidence-based policy. So the methods of design and design, this is questions that uh, is the same as I said before. So we, 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 we use descriptive, qualitative, qualitative research, we use a propulsive sampling, etc., etc. So in early, so after the match fixing cases that went very viral in Indonesia, uh, we, we knew that this federation needs a new leadership because uh, the then passage chairman, uh, a former army general, Mr. Eddie, stepped down in January. So then in May, we initiated, we started to uh, do a focus group and design a uh, hypothesis, what kind of leaders do we need at, a, at an organization like the Association. And then uh, in, in May and June, we sent a qualitative survey to more than 50 sport governance experts, experts across the world. 20 responded to the survey. And in mid-July, we released the outcome of the study through a press conference which gathered around 24 journalists. And the hypothesis is like that. Uh, the ideal leader of an organization like Football Association should be independent, should be uh, having a proven track record of integrity, 
successful in career, uh, very senior, uh, not affiliated with politics, uh, and secured or rich financially. And then the result is all, all of those uh, attributes were proved by the respondents unless the rich uh, attributes. So it means that to become a chairman or leader of uh, organization like football association, you don't, need, you don't need to be rich first. So it is excluded from, from our research. And the interesting, the most interesting one is uh, the most powerful attributes of, of, of this are, of this is the integrity. Uh, absolute, uh, all of respondents said that integrity is, is the must. Right. Uh, and then additional uh, qualitative responses said that a good leader indeed very impactful for an organization like football association and then a good leader can create trust and images and uh, but it is also influenced by the environment of the organization it is also influenced by the uh, government system of the organization and then what kind of leader do you want to see at a football association the, the experts say uh, he must be excellent in diplomacy, uh, can, on, can accommodate interest from stakeholders, and possess good leadership and managerial skills. So in conclusion, uh, a good leaders or ideal, ideal leaders, leadership at a football association is very impactful, is very needed uh, in, in at an organization like football association, and then there are attributes that is proved by this, this study that the leader must be independent, must be very senior, excellent diplomacy, very successful, etc. etc. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Luis Haas. I'm from Brazil, uh, but now I'm living in Portugal, uh, in Lisbon, uh, working on my PhD in uh, University of Lisbon, and this is the second time I'm here in the Play the Game conference, uh, representing a, a Brazilian non-profit organization at Sobre Sport. That means in English, I'm from sports. And uh, I've been working the last five years together with Luis Felipe here, presented, uh, as a consult uh, sport governance consultant in the project that I will present called Solo Sport, Sport Governance Award. I will start my presentation with a short uh, history about the award. Uh, it started in 2013 when the, the Brazil had a, a big change in sport legislation. Uh, and made some topics related to sport governance a reality in the Brazilian sport environment. For instance, uh, for, uh, the obligation of term of limits in national sport federations, uh, the presence of athletes in general assembly or uh, technical committees, and also some issues related to transparency. Uh, only uh, national sport uh, organizations who fulfill some of these obligations uh, were allowed to receive public money uh, in 2013. And then in 2015, uh, the country was leaving the final of the period that we call the decade of sports. And the society started to increase the pressure on sport organizations who had received high public investment in the recent year, in the previous years. In the same period, our team of consultants 
was hired to conduct a project. And uh, this project resulted in the tool that allowed us to measure and compare the adoptions of good governance practices in national sport federations. And then, uh, uh, the combination of uh, the, this result of the project and the external pressures, the pressure, uh, we decided to create an award uh, with the objective was to reward the national federations that had the best results in our evaluation. The question in our mind at that period was how the tool could help uh, the national sport organizations to improve the adoption of good governance practice in the day to daily basis. Uh, well, we had uh, negative uh, critical comments, comments of the national leaders after the first award. They come to us and say, who are you to measure us? What kind of measuring are you doing? Why you are doing this? Uh, some, some, some of them this, uh, uh, pressure us uh, lawsuits uh, for the, our organization, but we decided that this was a good opportunity to shed some light in this issue. And uh, well, in 2016, uh, we had the Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic game and officially ended uh, the period of mega events in our country. And I, as I usually say, after a big party, there is also a big hangover. And then uh, we started a new period, a new era in our sport environment after 2016. But understanding that the project has achieved a good result in the first edition, uh, we decided to organize the second edition that took place in the end of 2016. And that was the best thing we, we made. In 2017, we achieved excellent partnerships that allowed the project to gain new proportions. Uh, the partnership of the, with the project Intelligencia Sportiva, Sport Intelligence, here represented in this Congress uh, by a group of, of professors and, and researchers, and also we received uh, the invitation by Play the Game to be part of the first National Sport Governance Observer project and brought a new dimension and more technical knowledge for the project. In, in 2017, so, we decided to uh, organize the third uh, edition of Soul Sport uh, Governance Award. In the beginning of 2018, uh, new changes made the sport legislation stricter in terms of good governance and so the sporty, uh, sport governance award happened again in the end of the year. And now we are again working to the uh, sport governance award in 2019. And what I will show now is some data that we collected in the last four years and to share with you some information. Uh, it's important to say uh, some two, uh, to highlight two premises that encourage us to hold the award in the last four years. We believe that just as in sports, the way to encourage and motivate participants is not to punish the last, but rewarding the best. Uh, we never show the results uh, under the, the fifth position. We only publicize the results of the top five organizations. Uh, the, 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 the organizations that are under the sixth place and others, we just have private meet, meetings to show the results and to show them how they can be better. This competitive environment uh, will motivate the NSO, NSO uh, leaders and managers to seek better results and consequently they will adopt good governance practice without feeling obligated to do so. This competitive environment motivates people and ends up helping the incorporation of best practices in sport organization. So, uh, I will now explain the instrument and how it was developed and how the data were collected. Uh, in 2015, our initial references were the documents, documents presented in the slide. We used international guides and documents mixed with national documents and guides and also all the Brazilian legislation. 
the objective was to develop uh, a tool completed for the Brazilian uh, environment. And the final version of this instrument contains five, five dimensions. The first one, tra transparency, that is a very important dimension for us because we, we, as we will see in the methodology, we evaluate only documents that are public. The democracy, democracy and equity dimension were evaluated also, uh, and the accountability, uh, it's another dimension, institutional integrity, and uh, uh, the last but not the least, the modernization that we looked at the uh, organizational structure of the national federations. So the instrument uh, is a, uh, has undergone change in the last four years as a result of the changing legislation and the new techno uh, technical knowledge that we learned during the project. Started with uh, 106 uh, items and now we have 156 items. Uh, the, the, the data uh, were collected only on online documents in the website of national federations and other, other official websites. Uh, and uh, these yes or no uh, indicators, uh, you have only yes or no. And the index is calculated by the, the items value multiplied for the number of items in each dimension and after that divided for the total of number of items. Well, this is the result of the last four years. So, um, here we have the first year, rugby, table tennis, volleyball, athletics, and uh, shooting. It, the second year is rugby, rainbow, volleyball, table tennis, and athletics. The, the 2017 rugby, athletics, table tennis, volleyball, and sailing. And for the first time in 2018, we have a change situation because of this competitive uh, environment motivate another organizations to create best practices and now rugby that was the best during the last three years and have almost the same index is now on the fifth position and the other three organizations are with uh, for the first time they uh, passed the line of the seven points on the index so this uh, shows us how the competitive ambient are motivating the organizations to, to get a better result. So, well, I'm out of time, but in transparency, democracy, and accountability, we see that there are not so many um, changing in, in the recent years. This is uh, dimensions that are with no var with big variations, but in the institutional integrity and modernization, we start to see some variations that are interesting to get further, to, to get more uh, results. For instance, uh, the medians in institutional integrity changed and the modernization also. So, what we think about the future is the, my last slide. Yeah. Well, For the theoretical standpoint, we think that we should uh, work to enhance the data analysis with inferential techniques and start to compare specific indicators uh, among the NSO. And we have to try to develop a sustainable uh, model to maintain the project for the next years because we have to be financed, but this financing, uh, we have to maintain the, the independent process of the project. So we are trying to find this uh, uh, sustainable model. Sorry about the time, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mauricio Hernandez from Colombia, uh, from uh, Transparency in Sport in Colombia, who's going to talk about good governance and elite sport in Colombia, and as far as I understand, do a comparison among athletes and sex. Good morning, good morning everyone, I am Mauricio, uh, I, am, I will use this conference 
to share my story. This story started in 2009 when I met Jens in Colombia. I set a goal, the goal to attend to this conference. Ten years later, I, I am making real this dream. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the Play the Game conference, and special to Jens and Mikel. We say thank you, really thank you for this chance. And uh, second one, I am honored to be here um, and having a high qualified audience like you. I want to say an special mention to, to Roland, uh, the director of I Trust Sport. We are trying to build a network, so please do not go away at the end of this event. So let's let's talk about a little bit about this story. Um, this lecture is based on a thesis I did in South Korea in the last two years. Um, so when I came, I mean, I will I will say my thoughts about how close or how far are we in Colombia of having a policy of good governance. So I founded Transparency in Sport as a bridge between the good intentions of, governor, of governments and private sport organization. In theory, both do want to have good governance, but both we ha have a lot of problems of implementation, which is the magical word here. So, let's talk about a little bit about how this dream started. I lived in Seoul for 18 months thanks to the DTM Master Program, which is a program founded by KSPO, which is a private organization. Uh, I will tell you later about the business model, but in overall, this, is a la this was a life change experience. As you can see, we are 24 students from 24 different countries, and the guy in the middle is Professor Kang. He, he created this master seven years ago with the goal of foster a new generation of sports managers from countries where the sport is not well developed. So my thesis was about the basic universal principles of good governance of the IOC. What I wanted to do was to compare the knowledge and the perception of the executive board members and athletes. Let's talk about a little bit about the context of a sport in Colombia. Right now, in my country, football professional soccer players are doing a strike because they are requesting, between others, share revenues, social security, a new calendar, Second one, there are allegations of match fixing and result of ticketing. People in the National Federation, they are saying that the Asian Mafia is trying to infiltrate our system and they can say that we have our own. <laughs> Maria Luisa Calle, the girl you, say, you can see there, she won a bronze medal in Athens in 2004. She was banned for doping by the time. She lost her medal. But the NOC and government started, they appeal under the CAS, and after one year, they, she got her medal, go back. And she recovered the medal and her honor. But 11 years after, she, she had the same problem again, but with one difference. No medal were involved in the deal. So she was completely dismissed by the system. We have a system which only support athletes when they are winning and they are giving a high performance and results. We don't have white elephants. In some cases, we just have unfinished venues. So the context is quite problematic. And also, when I asked my professors in the Seoul National University, I asked to all of them, how is the status of studies who take in account the voice of athletes and some of their replies were like this in overall the voice of the athletes is not well taken into account unfortunately so what i did was a survey 
uh, I had to do raffles <laughs> to have the participation of athletes because they are not really engaged with this kind of studies or proposals, even when they have to answer really long uh, questionnaires. So I had to do some raffles to engage athletes. And uh, overall, our culture system, especially in sport, is not really active in participation. So I try to understand the perception and try to compare the difference between both groups, athletes and the board members. So, um, I explain in detail every one of the seven basic universal principles and take care of this. We, I used a scale, yeah, and a scale as you can see, we had positive scores and negative scores. So the results, basically, I am not going to talk about the statistic, don't you worry, this is not going to be Boring, but just to say one thing, the lowest score in athletes were negative and were transparency. And the highest, but not very high, as you can see, is in 0 0.1, it was the autonomy. They have a perception that the sport system is autonomous. Let's compare the executives. Yeah, the executives The highest score was solidarity. I mean, executives perceive our system themselves like it's a, we have a good system of solidarity that sometimes can be used in favor of elections and voting and so on. And the lowest score were athlete representation, which, which refers to the athlete's involvement, participation, and care. I have to say that all, all the scores had significant difference in the seven basic universal principles. Move on. Okay. Yeah, in this graphic, as you can see, all the results from the executive board member side were positive, and all the scores from the athlete side were negative, just with two small exceptions. But what I want to say here is that the sport movement cannot reform itself. The sport movement has a long tradition, not only in my country, in international sport, has a long tradition of uh, low participation in the decision-making process. And another reflection I want to do before finish is that the, this crisis of the sport movement are bringing opportunities for independent and professional organizations such as I Trust Sport and Transparency in Sport and others which are here. I would like to say thank you, Declan, for being here. When I grow up, I will be like you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so, what are we doing? Two minutes. Okay, good timing. This is the last one. So, our proposal is so simple. This is not rocket science. <laughs> what we propose is to increase education through an online platform. This online platform is already, I mean, it's working. Unfortunately, it's in Spanish because it's for my country and for Latin American country. But this is the one of the points. The second one is to increase athletes' involvement and to increase, I mean, to invite the assessment of other stakeholders in the assessment of governance. Because at the end of the day, Governance is just a picture of what, is, is, is what rules are in, in place. And the third one is to increase the accountability of sports organizations. I mean, how to do that? The best way to do that is with the participation of civil society in the following up of the governance. I mean, governance is not, is not a picture of one day. It's about the culture. And the only one who can do following this, in my point of view, is the civil society engagement. So thank you very much. Please do not go away. I will say again that we want to create a network, a supporting network with the leadership of Roland Jack from iTrust and Guntur. Thank you very much.
Croatia. And our final speaker is with me, Ragnar. Something, something in that. Who's going to talk about risk management and empathy for World Cup? Thank you. Um, so my name is Whitney, and although my background is risk management and a little bit of law enforcement, I'm actually here in front of you today as a recent master's graduate of the world's first program in sport ethics and integrity. So that's a sign that the industry is changing. After six universities in six nations, 21 students from 17 countries defended our research at the IOA. Now, I'm not here to promote my master's program, but there is a reason why I wanted to open with this mentioning. The field of sport integrity is evolving, it's growing, and we have momentum. So, all right. so my generation, that's the generation Y and Z, are very invested in sport integrity. We also make up some key stakeholders. We make up the athletes, your current athletes, and the newly retired. We also make up your current and prospective supporters. This generation has more spending power and longer spending power than any generation before us. So earning our loyalty will get you a long way. There has been some progress in governance structures over the last few years to include more input from athletes and supportive stakeholders. But these group of athletes and these group of supporters are also taking initiatives into their own hands by naming and shaming, by banding together, and by taking a knee. This year, seven retired Olympic athletes will enter into this same program, hoping to speed up resolving some of the integrity issues they face in their careers that are taking too long to change. So, keeping fans and the subsequent corporate investment requires a good, a good reputation. Um, PricewaterhouseCooper put this study out a few weeks ago and it shows the top threats to revenues in the sport industry. Decreasing fan loyalty, lack of trust in sport governing bodies, and integrity top the list. So, the numbers don't lie. Um, a huge chunk of your stakeholders have spoken and they're paying attention and they want to know and see. Are you active when it comes to integrity? Are you pursuing integrity for its own sake or simply for a means of profit or not at all? So, when it comes to dealing with integrity, specifically match fixing in North America, the problem is not that we don't know what to do. We know what to do. The problem is that these things have to be implemented and they have to be seen to be implemented. For my research, I looked at the United Hosts, Canada, USA, Mexico, and I applied standardized international risk management framework. I wanted to do a risk assessment to show all the functional areas that they're in danger by not addressing this risk. In the bid book, United Hosts labeled themselves as low risk for corruption. So I wanted to look at well, what are they doing right now in terms of integrity independently? And what are they planning to do together? Well, this resulted in a 90-page report on why we need better risk management and support and what we have to do leading up to 2026, but I have five minutes. So I decided to focus on just one simple, extremely simple risk indicator that everybody can do better on right now. So I'm going to speak to you today about alignment. Many organizations do not align with their promise to uphold and promote and protect integrity. And with these continuous corruption scandals, more and more athlete and supporter stakeholders are demanding transparency that steps have been implemented to tackle integrity issues. Okay, so this is a particular goal that frequents pretty much every sport organization's values, vision, and mission. In 2026, we have the world's biggest event coming to North America, and if you examine the 400-page bid book, the governance material, minus Mexico, because they don't have any, their websites, this is over 1,000 pages of strategic planning, and there are no transparent plans, processes, or programs to address sport corruption, no explicit acknowledgement about match fixing, no current actions are available, these things are all synonymous for planning the achievement of this particular objective. So how are you low risk? So good governance and risk management, they go hand in hand, and it's already used in pretty much every other major industry. And thanks to work done by the IOC, the UNODC, the CAC, and Australia, it's slowly being introduced into good governance repertoire. 
Risk management helps us better identify our risks by looking at things such as our goals against our existing procedures and action plans. So goals versus action plans. It might sound so obvious, but if we look at things as simple as an organization's mission and vision and objectives, you'd be surprised how many organizations do not publish this information. If your goal is to protect and to promote integrity, what are you doing to get there? Are your actions aligned to your purpose? These are simple fundamentals, that is sharing your vision and mission, and they're so often overlooked, but these ought to be the foundational guidelines for your organization. So, we already know the current threats when it comes to not dealing with match fixing. And when it comes to soccer in North America, some experts, like Declan Hill, have been advising leaders since before 2008 to make changes, and that was over 10 years ago. So, how can we move forward when decision makers already know the risks, they know the threats, they know the threats, and they apparently have the solutions? Well, after speaking with numerous sport organizations and leaders over the last couple of years, I, and having this risk lens, I noticed a trend. Sport organizations typically look at risk to avoid the consequence. We need to better demonstrate the opportunities. Risk aversion has so much more potential than just ticking boxes. So, Risk doesn't mean loss, and risk doesn't mean consequence. Risk means uncertainty. And right now, a big uncertainty is, how is North America dealing with sport corruption? So what can they gain from addressing matrixing or integrity threats? Well, aside from being a more diligent leader, by preparing for risks, organizations can position themselves to capture market opportunity. In other industries, how you maintain and manage and improve your risk make you a more safe and more smarter investment over those who do not. So I made a really simple, simple if, infographic to show what's going on now where we need to be. Right now, we're very silent when it comes to match fixing, like anti-match fixing plans and progresses, unless there's a scandal. And when it comes to initiatives around match fixing, it's looked at if we talk about it, it's gonna harm our commercial viability. But with good risk management, you can better see your opportunities. And this is where we need to be. And for the people that are advocating for integrity initiatives within their organizations, this is what we have to tell. How we can leverage our leadership position to our fans, to our supporters, and to our sponsors with our progress compared to the market. And understanding that having recognition as a leader earns you fan loyalty and it earns you commercial viability. And instead of just stopping at the tick boxes, we can set precedent. We can benchmark bidding and hosting and organizational requirements surrounding integrity. So strategies about creating successful outcomes for yourself. This is an opportunity. Sharing your plan, sharing your learning, and sharing your wins. So again, if your goal is to promote and to preserve integrity, what are you doing to get there? So that study on the earlier page that I showed about decreasing fans and trust, significant to sports reputation as a trustworthy institution is the ability of organizations to meet the promises that they make. Um, alignment. Otherwise, the message you're sending is you don't know the problem, you don't understand the problem, you don't care about the problem, and these are all bad messages to send. So, last slide. Uh -oh. So we have three great nations who have an opportunity to set an integrity precedent for future mega event hosts. They can make integrity initiatives as necessary as legacy, sustainability, environment, the biggest source of catastrophe for United hosts will be shortcomings around strategy if they do not better align with their promise to uphold, promote, and protect integrity. It has to be implemented, and it has to be seen to be implemented. This generation, we want to see it. The United hosts can't control betting legislation, nor law around sport corruption in the three nations, and I don't have to tell anyone in this room that these are the two biggest pillars in the fight against match fixing. But when it comes to the single largest threat to sport, many changes, starting with alignment, can be made today. There are six years to go. The world is watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brittany. Um, despite my time management, we still have time for questions. So um, if, if anybody out there, is, is anybody having the first question? Yes, uh, question for Amal. Um, I think there will be a microphone coming. 
Thank you. A question for Amal on your study. Uh, proven track record of integrity. I'm curious as to how you may have qualified that term and um, what traits that characteristic may, uh, may have identified. Uh, yeah, that that criteria is obvious, obviously we also uh, have not uh, made a, the measurement. So at the at the press conference in July, uh, the the journalists also asked the same question: uh, how to track or how to know that this person having good integrity, this person honest. Or, so I I end up. Uh, with an answer that maybe we can try to find a national figure that in in that ha that has been in defiance of corruption or in, in a simple way in Indonesia we have a corruption eradication commission so a government agency that is uh, a proposed to tackle uh, corruption so I said to the journalist that maybe we can uh, put former leaders of the commission to be the leader or to be candidate of the federation but also I think it's, it is a good uh, discourse or a good uh, thing that maybe we, we, we have to start to, to measure whether this was a, but uh, uh, then uh, from the commission the, the, the commission is actually the most trusted uh, government agency in Indonesia, so we call it KPK. So, uh, one of the reasons is because uh, one of the experts of the study said that it's not really uh, necessary that leader of a federation understand the sport. So, as well as they can lead, or, or he can lead, as well as, uh, as long as he can uh, Put integrity as the first uh, trait. So, 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 so uh, I, I think hope, hope that answers your question. Any other questions? So, uh, thank you all for the very interesting presentations. Um, you're all um, working to tackle deficiencies you've identified in the sort of in government or public systems behind major events and so on. Do you think? For any of you, do you think the way forward is work, trying to work with governments and public authorities, <coughs> or is it at the moment necessary to sort of kind of work from outside? As you, as you've been doing so far? Is there anybody who uh, want to start off? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sir. Hello? Yes. Yeah, it is a tricky question because. Usually the money is coming from government and the government is really interested in do propaganda through National Federation and National Olympic Committee. We are trying to, to follow a different road which is like uh, from maybe three different kind of sources. First one, we should try to work with the sponsors because the sponsors of the sport are putting their image and their, yeah, we can say that, they, they, they brand close to the federation. So this could be one, working with the sponsors. The second one is civil society or crowdfunding. You know that the media is facing a big crisis and the new model of funding from new media is through crowdfunding. I mean, it is better to have one, uh, one million of followers and each of them can give one dollar to, to support that initiative. And the third one, uh, we are trying to do transparency in the sport through international cooperation. It is, it is very difficult to be independent in a financial way. So. Yeah, to, to, to resume my question is sponsors, civil society, and international cooperation. Thank you. Did, uh, we did 
Yeah. And so you, you, you wrote down so it looked like you wanted to turn so. Yeah, I mean, in looking at the situation in Canada and US and Mexico, I definitely think there needs to be more government support because when it comes to match fixing, as we know, um, having adequate legislation to tackle corruption and having the appropriate betting legislation needs to be there. So yeah, we, they, we do need that support in all three of our countries. And yeah, the US made a small step uh, over the last couple of years with their betting, but I mean, like we have a long way to go. So until we have that support, I mean, we're not really gonna be able to effectively move forward with, with this particular threat. And I mean, yeah, they should be very interested because these are Canadians, these are Americans, these are these are Mexicans, these are international people who who are victims and suffering potentially these you know, systematic injuries and harm to, to their life, their livelihood. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I will try to explain what happened with us. Uh, we started completely, completely uh, independent for the government. Uh, but, uh, of course, that the government saw in the award an uh, important uh, moment to appear sometimes and we invited them to, to participate, to, to give the award, to be there. Uh, well, the second phase uh, happened after the partnership with the uh, uh, Sport Intelligence Program that we decided to share some data with the Ministry of Sports to them try to create uh, a, their own tool to measure and to compare the national federations to distribute more fairly uh, the, the money, the public money. Uh, of course, they, they are trying to, to create this, this tool. It's not easy for them because they have like pressures for the organizations and for the sport leaders. Uh, but we are trying to not be dependent of them but to uh, work together with them, with them. So that is what is happening now. We are not have a, a completely uh, situation of partnership, but we are working together. Yeah, we, have, we have to say also that the academy universities has a critical role, but at the end of the day, it depends on the integrity of the scholars, because a lot of the scholars are also very concerned about uh, making the contract, not doing well their job. So, yeah, at the end of the day, everything depends on people, you know. Yeah, any, any other questions? Um, if, if not, then I, I have a question for, for, for you, Luis. Because I think what, what, you, what you've done, I, th I think, is, is really great, and I think the, the thing that's really good with what you've done is that it's a very positive approach that you're taking to governance. You're not trying to shame anybody, but what you're trying to do is actually celebrating achievements. And I think that's, that's, that's really, really good what, you, what you've done. And then I'm very surprised to hear that the organized sports sector actually received this with threats of lawsuits. And can you, can you just talk a little bit about what was their, what was their background? How, why did they threaten you and what was their reasons to threaten you? Because I think what you've done is the exact right way. It's trying to celebrate people who do well. Yeah. Well, I, I think that was the, firm, the normal first reaction for some of them, that they never heard some, some issues related to governance, and they started to, to see this movement as something that threatened them uh, in their like, uh, uh, situation. Uh, but it was only the first uh, edition. In the second edition, they start to call us and to say, can we schedule a meeting to you explain us what, what is going on, what points can I uh, do better, what, what kind of uh, actions I, 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 I have to do to, to get better results. And now, the, uh, the, this, this edition, we start to receive emails and phone calls saying, Look our website now, we have all the documents there. They are sending uh, weekly emails for us. Now is the minute of the last board meeting now. Sometimes it's, <laughs> oh, it's just, okay, thank you, okay, thank you. They are, they are trying to, to show us that they are uh, making progress and, and they are trying to show us to not to lose the, what they are putting on the website, like uh, any kind of documents. 
And that is the interesting part. They are really motivated to, to get the result. And that changing in the first place that happened last year really changed the situation because the rugby uh, national federation is a new one in Brazil. They are created in 2010. So they have like a, a more modernized uh, structure. And they, they used to be like the, uh, the best one. They used to be all the time in the first place. And when they lost the, the award, they <coughs> changed positions. They uh, t took the, the responsibility for the good governance practices and they changed the, the, the executive. So this is very nice to, to see happen. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I just want to add, like, the program that, that they have done is a fantastic ex example of looking of a group of people looking at a problem and not focusing on the negative um, or threat of the risk, which is exactly corroborating what I'm trying to say. This is a fantastic strategy because they're looking at the risk by the opportunity. And they're leveraging people's position and that is getting companies to shift from their complacency and shift from their weaknesses and okay so you have to do a little bit of this game to to get the stakeholder buy-in but to earn that leverage you you know it's resulting in an improvement of an organization's performance and their outcomes and this is, this can be measured and this can be used to you know gain future future sponsorships get better reputation uh, improve the trust of your, your athletes. So, I mean, like, this is a fantastic example. Just, just another quick example. We had a meeting in the Handball Federation. They were uh, world champion in 2013 or 14. Yeah. And, and we was in the president uh, meeting room and there was the world champion trophy and the sport governance trophy, <laughs> one by side. <laughs> just, the, just to show to the stakeholders during the meeting that they are world champion, and that they are the, the good governance practice uh, award also. So, of course, they had problem before that. After that, they had a lot of problems, <laughs> the corruption cases. But we try to say we are not giving the award to the person, to the president. We are giving the award to the organization because sometimes they use it in, to show that they are good persons. And that's not the, our objective. I think if, just the, the last question before, uh, before lunch, I think, uh, Mark, did you have a question? Well, that last, that last point maybe addresses my question, so I'm not sure if it's relevant. Uh, you tell me. So the point about the rugby example, one could easily say, well, they've got nothing to lose. They've got their reputation. But when we look at FIFA or the IAAF, these people have billions to protect. Um, so I'm just going to wonder a question out loud. Um, I can't imagine that FIFA haven't done their risk analysis with all the team at their uh, uh, availability. But they may not want to make that transparent because it will make ready to the observing public the problem. So, so how do you think these very large and wealthy organizations should balance reputational protection, keeping sponsors on side, keeping the viewing public uh, figures high, along with the value of transparency? Because it's not either or, it's, it's how you balance these things. Any thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the harm to commercial viability is a huge issue when it comes to a lot of integrity stuff, specifically match fixing. But um, I really also think that's kind of an archaic way of looking at it because we know the threats and we know the issues and, and nothing's moving forward. I think that you can be transparent in ways that are proactive instead of reactive. So instead of relying on our codes of conduct, we can say, hey, we've launched this education program, we're training people. Um, so, you know, we were building external relationships. Um, we've got this sponsor investment because of our integrity work. Um, you know, by setting and achieving good governance benchmarking and advertising, I think a lot of, a lot of cases, um, work's being done and it's not being shared. And why are we not sharing the good stuff? Because that influences and it creates competition amongst the organizations. And as, as it's been said by, by Luis here, that competition is getting the ball rolling. And I think that's 
That's the direction we need to go. Someone has to start and set the precedent, and then everyone else will follow. Anybody else want to comment? I just, I just want to say that for small organizations and uh, yeah, with low resources, it is really nice to be driven by positive, uh, in, uh, yeah, positive inputs like this exercise. But I think that largest organizations, such as FIFA and UEFA, they are scandal driven. So if they see like uh, the FBI is behind or the OCD or the United Nations, probably they are going to open a door. Otherwise, they are just going to, to cheat us. I would like to add, uh, I would give you an in in example in, in the last uh, match fixing cases in Indonesian soccer. Uh, in theory, uh, when, like in Italy, when, when the culture will happen, uh, the attendance record will go down and maybe commercial viability will, uh, will be affected. But in Indonesia, where the people are currently developing, our human development index is very low. Uh, in, it's very, you know, interesting that when the last season where the mass fixing cases uh, named 15 suspects with criminal charge, and then the opening of the new season is still uh, attended by lots of supporters. So they don't really care about the mass fixing. And also with the sponsors, the sponsors are still there. The, they, the, the league, the leaks still got a new sponsor, maybe even bigger. Uh, uh, if you ever heard about Shopee with Cristiano Ronaldo, so I think the relation, uh, correlation or uh, uh, relationship between transparency and uh, risk of losing commercial uh, income, losing attendance record, it's sometimes not relevant in some countries like. Maybe in the so for the research, uh, I think is needed. So yeah, I just want to say that thing. Thank you very much. I think I think we're gonna close it down now before people get too hungry and uh, you know people start complaining that I keep them from lunch. But before you guys go to lunch, please join me in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you very much.